Welcome back to Winning Souls for Christ, a radio show designed to teach, equip, and empower you for the mission of the new evangelization. I'm your host, Isaac Longworth, and this past week, I think many of us have seen just how dark the world that we live in can be. Racism, violence, looting, hatred of one another, these sins have been on display. Every time we have turned on our TVs, every time we've looked on our screens, every time we've seen what the media is reporting on, the darkness that exists in our world has been made visible. And yet this darkness of sin, this darkness of evil is always present in our society, in the corrupt society that we live in right now. Every single day, thousands of innocent preborn children are killed through abortion. Our society, our generation has a twisted understanding of what sex is, of what marriage is. And this twisting has been glorified and celebrated. Women and children have been sold into human trafficking, treated as objects to be bought and sold for the pleasure of others. Drug and alcohol abuse has destroyed minds, poisoned families and brought destruction to entire neighborhoods. We've seen systematic corruption and injustice towards the poor, the marginalized, the weak, and the vulnerable. And we need to call these things what they are. Sin, evil, darkness. And the only answer to this problem of sin is Jesus. The only answer is the salvation that he brings, which is why evangelization is more crucial than ever in the darkness. Because in every time and in every place, the church is called to bring the light of Christ into conflict with the darkness of the world. In John chapter 17, verse 16 through 18, Jesus is praying a beautiful prayer to his father. He says of his disciples, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth, for your word is truth. As you did send me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. It's a powerful prayer. Jesus is saying that even though we live in the world, we are not to live as the world does. We are not to glorify and participate in the darkness and the evil that we see all around us, but rather with the word of God within us, with his truth, we have been sent into the world to bring the gospel, to bring peace where there is war, to bring light where there is darkness. And as Christians, we need to recognize the fact that we are called not to somehow hide ourselves away, to keep ourselves safe and comfortable, but we are called to be light in the darkness. It's not our place as Christians, as Catholics, to gather in our gated communities, to hide behind our church doors, but we are called to go out on mission. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 15, Jesus says, nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Brothers and sisters, have we allowed ourselves to become bushel basket Christians? Have we, out of a desire for comfort, out of a desire to get along with everyone, out of a desire to just remain in peace in our own homes, have we put a basket over the light of Jesus that is supposed to shine out of us. And if we have done this, we need to look within ourselves and repent and turn back to the Lord and remember our priorities. Take off that basket and let the light of Christ that is in you be a lamp to those who are all around. Take a stand. This is our patrimony. This is what we are called to do as Catholics. And this is what we have always done. You see, throughout the history of the church, Christians have always been bold witnesses to their faith, even in the midst of great darkness. At the height of the Roman Empire, Rome was filled with corruption, sexual immorality, depravity, much like our culture today. And yet Christianity flourished in the empire, despite their best efforts to destroy the gospel. 
Christians were dragged out of their homes, imprisoned, beaten, tortured, thrown to wild animals in front of cheering crowds, and yet the church continued to grow. Why? It's because those Christians continued to share their faith. They continued to evangelize. They continued to proclaim the gospel despite the persecution, despite the fact that they could be killed for proclaiming the name of Jesus. And this courage and this boldness has continued even to our modern times when perhaps more martyrs than ever are dying for their faith in Jesus in China, in Africa, in the Middle East, all over the world. Christians are willing to shine like torches in the midst of their dark and corrupt societies and governments to share Jesus, even if it means their life. Where does this boldness come from and how can we have it as well? Well, from the very fact that God's Holy Spirit lives in us, we can have courage because we live in hope that no matter what happens to us here on earth, no matter what trials we face, no matter what we have to endure, we can be confident that once this life is over, we will be with the Lord in heaven. We are not citizens of this earth. We are citizens of heaven. Everything in this earth is transitory, is passing away. And that can give us great hope. And all of this is because of the gift of the Holy Spirit that has been poured into our hearts. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, You also who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. He's saying all of you Christians have heard the gospel. You have heard the good news that God loves you. You've heard the bad news that your sin has destroyed that relationship with God that he longs to have with you. And yet you have believed in Jesus, the one who was sent as our atonement, as our redemption, who has rescued us from sin. And you have been baptized into the church. You have been received into Christ by your faith. And as such, you have received the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on, he says, this Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit is like the down payment, the first installment of our heavenly reward, that it's coming soon. And as long as we remain true to Christ, that we remain rooted and united to him, that his Holy Spirit burns in our hearts, then we no longer need to be afraid of the darkness of our sinful world because it can't harm those who belong to Jesus. We don't need to be afraid of the world. We don't need to be afraid of the darkness in it. And Jesus exemplified this. He wasn't afraid to go into the darkness because he himself was the light. And we need to imitate him in this. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 10 through 13, it describes the fact that Jesus sat at table in the house, and behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with Jesus and his disciples. And this catches the attention of the Pharisees. It says, when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, these poor Pharisees, they're always the bad guys in the gospel, but this question kind of makes sense. They're saying, if your teacher, if this Jesus is so holy, if he's so pure, why is he eating with these public sinners? Why is he eating with these people who break God's law? But that's because the Pharisees understood holiness as leaving the outside world and being hidden and closed away from it working on exterior purity rather than interior purity. And Jesus has interior purity. And this is what he says to the Pharisees. He says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, of course, this is amazing news because we're the sinners that he came to save. We are the ones that he came who need the divine physician. 
But Jesus is saying, I came to call sinners, so I'm going to go where the sinners are. I'm going to eat with them. I'm going to have fellowship with them so that my mercy and my light can reach into the darkness that they are in so that I can rescue them from that. Jesus isn't afraid to be associated with sinners, and yet the Pharisees are. But that's because for Jesus, the sin of others doesn't tarnish him, but rather his purity cleanses them. And he demonstrates this in a physical way. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 2 through 3, it says, A leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. You see, the leprosy of this man doesn't have a hold on Jesus. But Jesus' holiness, his purity, his power for healing is able to touch the leper. And the same is true of his purity and his holiness. He reaches out to sinners, not afraid of what they will do to him, but because of his desire to reach them. And the Catholic response is to be something similar. We are not to hide ourselves away from the world, but we are rather to live in the world and thus transform it from within. In Lumen Gentium, which is one of the papal documents that came out of the Second Vatican Council, the Church Fathers uh, explained, the, the Council Fathers explained that the laity are called into the world by God, and that by ex exercising their proper function and led by the Spirit of the Gospel, they may work for the sanctification of the world from within as a leaven. In this way, they make Christ known to others. So it has this beautiful analogy of comparing Catholics to leaven that is added to bread. And a little bit of leaven makes the whole bread rise. And in the same way, Catholics are put into the world in order to make it holy from within. Now, is this true of you? Is this true of me? Are you being a light in your home? Are you being a light in your family, in your workplace? Is your parish, is your church? being a light to the city that you live in? What is your effect? Is your effect on your workplace making it more Christian? Or is your workplace making you less of a Christian? Is your church having an effect making the city that you live in more oriented towards Christ? Or is your city having the effect on the church that it is becoming more worldly? And we need to check ourselves routinely on this and not hiding away but rather going out. Now, not hiding away sometimes means that you'll find yourself in a situation that is out of your comfort zone. And that means that you need to be wise in order to avoid scandal. Because whenever we go out into the darkness and interact with people that are still trapped in the darkness, we run the risk of causing scandal to others who think that you are participating in what the world is doing. In Matthew, Chapter 10, verse 16, Jesus tells his disciples before they go out on mission, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Now, that's not a very comforting scene, right? Who wants to be a sheep in the middle of wolves? It's dangerous. So Jesus gives this advice. He says, So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Now, who's the serpent in the Bible? Well, the serpent usually represents Satan, right? The enemy. So Jesus is saying, be as wise as the enemy. Be as wise as the devil, but be innocent as doves. He's saying, go out into the world, which is dangerous, like sheep in the middle of wolves, but be wise about it. Be good, be wise, in order to avoid scandal. Now, we need to avoid scandal, of course, but the world is our mission field. It can be a dark place, but it will remain that way unless we bring the light there. And so we can't afford to leave people in darkness for fear of the dark. We need to be light to them or else they'll never know who Jesus is. I remember once I was street evangelizing, leading a group from a parish in the streets to teach them how to share the gospel. And I was evangelizing by myself and I met these two brothers. They were smoking outside of a bar. Uh, they were ex-Catholics and I began to share the gospel with them. I began to share with them how much God loved them. And uh, they were fine with hearing that. They didn't believe in God, but it didn't trigger them at all. But then I started to share with them the reality of sin and evil. 
and that their sin had separated them from God and that they needed a savior. And at this, they didn't really like that as much. And they began to argue a little bit more, but it was still a really good conversation. Well, at one point they asked me to come into the bar with them because they were going to go back and have another drink. And they said, can we continue this conversation inside? And I had a decision to make. I could go inside that bar and risk scandal, risk looking like I was just going in to get a drink instead of evangelizing, especially in front of all the people of the parish. But if I stayed outside and said, no, I don't go into bars, then I would miss this chance to continue sharing Jesus with them. And so I think I made the right decision. I went in with them and I continued to share the gospel with them. And even though they didn't repent and turn away and become, you know, uh, Catholics going back to mass, they did begin to agree with me that there was more evil and sin in the world than they thought there was. And they took some of my materials that I had about coming back to church that I gave to them and they would read it later. So we need to be wise and aware of our surroundings while still refusing to be ruled by the fear of what other more scrupulous Christians think about you, right? You need to have both of these skills in order to be an effective evangelist, not afraid of others, but also being wise enough to know not to fall into uh, being in places of sin that make it look uh, in a scandalous way. Another good example of this is once uh, I was street evangelizing with a brother seminarian from the Companions of the Cross, which is the religious order that I'm a part of. And we were going out into the streets. We all had matching t-shirts on with, you know, big crosses. And, and we were going out and inviting people off the street to come into a church, light a candle and pray with us. And so uh, as we're walking down the street, we found ourselves in front of a gentleman's club, in front of a, a strip club. Now, of course, it would be in incredibly scandalous for a seminarian to be seen as a patron of one of these places. And so we wanted to reach out to the people there, but we also didn't want to be seen as participating. So we stood away from the door, but we had our big Jesus t-shirts on. So we thought, this means that people won't think that we're, that we're patronizing this place, but we began to reach out to the people going in. And I remember this one man walked by and he was going into the gentleman's club and he had a giant um, cast on his leg. And we called out to him and we said, can we pray for your leg that Jesus heals your leg? And he said, well, I don't know. And he was kind of thinking about it. But then my, my friend said, but if Jesus heals your leg, you can't go into that building because you know that it's wrong what they're doing in there. And you know, you can't participate in that. And the man said, well, in that case, I don't want any healing. And he walked in. He was willing to go into that place of sin rather than even let Jesus heal his leg. Right? There was this dichotomy there. So we need to be reaching out to people while also not approving of the lifestyle that they're living and showing that we are in opposition to that, that the light is coming into conflict with the darkness. And remember that the darkness cannot drown out the light of Christ. Remember that Jesus has already won the victory and then let his love overcome any fear that you have of going into the darkness. I remember once I was at the March for Life in Ottawa, the National Anti-Abortion March in Ottawa, Canada. And the pro-choice counter-protesters had kind of been corralled into this section of the street. Uh, they had tried to block the, the peaceful pro-life march. A lot of them were wearing masks. Uh, they were very violent. They were very antagonistic. So the police had kind of corralled them with barricades into one section. And there was one guy who was wearing a pro-choice t-shirt and he too had a cast on his leg and he was standing a little bit to the side. I think he was waiting for the bus. Now I was wearing my pro-life t-shirt and I saw him with his leg and I thought maybe the Lord wants me to pray for his leg for healing. So I went over to him, but I was very afraid of him because he was the enemy, right? He was on the other side. But I muscled up some courage. I walked over to him and I said, can I pray for your leg? And I explained what I was, what I was going to do there. Now, I think he thought that I was there to argue with him. But when I told him I wanted to pray for his leg, that Jesus would heal him, he was the one that looked afraid. And he actually started to hobble away from me on the street and say, no, no, I don't want you to pray for me. Now, of course, I respected him. I respected his boundaries and I didn't chase him down because we don't want to be weird or pushy. 
We don't also want to be overconfident at all. But the love that I had for his soul, that I wanted him to know Jesus, overcame my fear of reaching out to the enemy. And I remembered that day that the victories with Jesus, that he seemed more afraid of me, full of the Holy Spirit, coming over and asking to pray for him, than I was being self-conscious and awkward to go and talk with him. Now, I do want to clarify that just because we have the final victory in Jesus doesn't mean that somehow there won't be trials or attacks in our life if we make the choice to go boldly into our lost and dying world and proclaim the truth of the gospel of Jesus. Because the reality is, is that many simply don't want to hear it. They don't want to see the light of Christ. I don't know if you have this experience, but I sure do. If you wake up early in the morning and it's all dark out and you turn on that light and that light hits your eyes, what do you do? I close my eyes. I squint them because the light is too bright. It hurts. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. Well, in the same way, there are many people that are living in the darkness of sin. And when you proclaim the light, it hurts. It's awkward. And they reject it. And they reject you. So there is a cost to preaching the gospel to a world that often doesn't want to repent, that doesn't want to hear it. I mentioned earlier that elsewhere in the world, you could face imprisonment, torture, martyrdom, shunning by your family. And that might not be the case here, but it could soon. We have no idea when and how we will be asked to surrender our life for Christ, but by looking at what's happening around us, martyrdom might be on the horizon sooner than we imagine, but we definitely face mockery, family strife, loss of friendships, maybe the loss of a job or a promotion because we will not go along with the darkness in the world. And yet, as Catholic evangelists, we are called to be light, despite the cost. It doesn't mean that it's easy. Sharing the gospel isn't easy because there is a cost to you personally, but it's so worth it. I remember one day, I really felt overwhelmed by darkness. I was outside of a busy inner city abortion clinic in Detroit, Michigan. And it was a cold, cold, windy day. I was freezing. People had rejected me all day. So many women had gone in for their scheduled appointment. I knew that babies were being killed right behind me and there was nothing I could do about it. People had sworn at me. They had threatened me. They had laughed at me and I felt hopeless. The darkness was closing in and I felt like my light was almost extinguished. And yet it was that moment where I was standing there on the sidewalk crying just from the desperation and the disappointment of the day that one of my seminarian brothers ran to me from the other side of the sidewalk and told me, Isaac, we just had a save. A woman who was scheduled for her abortion canceled and we brought her uh, to a ultrasound technician. He's going to look at her and we're going to give her the help that she needs. We had a save today. Praise the Lord Jesus. In the midst of the darkness, the light was not overcome. And so brothers and sisters, my call to you today is this, go with boldness. Take the light of Jesus into the darkness of this world, into the world that is corrupt and evil and sinful, and yet there are souls there waiting to hear about Jesus. Don't be afraid of the cost that will come to you as a result. Because in the grand scheme of things, it's all worth it to bring even one soul to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And then we can enjoy eternal happiness with them in heaven for all eternity. This is the mission. This is the call. And so I want to leave you with this words of St. Paul from 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says, therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they also may obtain salvation in Christ Jesus with its eternal glory. And let that be your call. Let that be my prayer today. Lord Jesus, let me endure everything, everything that the darkness has to throw at me, every trial, every persecution, every cost, in order that I may obtain salvation in Christ Jesus and that the sake of others may also come to know him as we have come to know him. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, uh, we've reached the end of our time now, but hopefully something in this show has taught, equipped, or empowered you for the mission of the new evangelization so that you can go out and set the world on fire for Jesus.